right, so welcome all back. I think we're back with the second session and we have Hugo who just graduated from EPFL. Hugo, take it away. Thank you. It's, um, it's, a very, it's really a pleasure to be here. I'm really a big fan of that conference. So thank you for the organizers for setting that up and inviting me. And so my name is Hugo and today I'll be talking about some theoretical insight we gathered in how attention layers learn. And this is joint work with Freya Behrens, uh, Florent Dracula and Lankos de Borova. So I think everyone is pretty familiar with that problem by now. It's kind of fair to say that language models are really settled in our daily lives more and more. But there's a bunch of mysteries that surround how they learn and how they work. One of those mysteries, of course, the emergence of new qualitative abilities as models go larger and larger. So we don't really know if they really exist, if they correspond to new abilities, under which conditions. If they emerge, they emerge, et cetera, et cetera. So what we really lack is a really fundamental, theoretical, precise understanding of even the simplest components of these large models, starting from attention modules. And that's kind of the perspective I want to adopt in this talk, is to try to give you a theoretical description, a simple one, of a simple setting for an attention layer, and give you some insights and some kind of intuition about what's happening when these modules are used to learn something. And this work started from a very simple observation, was motivated by a very simple observation that language as a data structure is very particular. Information in a sentence is encoded in, as it were, two ways. And the first thing it, information is encoded in, in a sentence is in the meaning of each word. So for example, if I take a sentence, the cat likes red apples, and I replace one of the words, I'm destroying information or I'm altering the information. The second way information is encoded is the sentence is by the relative positions of the words, the kind of their relative ordering. If I take this same sentence and I'm permutating the words, I'm also altering the information, destroying information. So information in a sentence is encoded in two ways, and the semantics or and also in the positions. And so I want to argue that the, you would like to learn, um, to, to have a new network that manages to learn and extract information from those two, uh, from those two things, positions and semantics. And I want to give you a very quick, uh, quick slide and argue, make the case that that's precisely what an attention layer is doing on a high level. So consider a sentence, which is length L, the number of rows, and each of the words, each of the tokens, has been embedded in D dimension. So your data, your input which is a sentence will look like a L times D matrix. And so the way an attention layer operates in the most simple case is by multiplying this input matrix on the left side by L times L matrix S of X. So typically that is parameterized as a dot product attention, which just means the softmax of some quadratic form of the input and that quadratic form is typically parameterized by two sets of weights called the keys and the query weights. And the data can be shifted by a fixed constant matrix called the positional encodings that people use in practice to give some positional information to the model. And so this L times L matrix is acting at the level of the positions, right? Because it's mixing, it's processing the positions, it's mixing the tokens. So it's acting and processing the positional information contained in your sentence. But that matrix is also dependent on the input X. So it's doing this positional information processing in a way that is also taking into account the semantics or the words that are in your sentence. So it's really trying to extract both types of information. And once you get this matrix multiplication, what you get from it is what is called the context vector which can then be fed downstream to another neural network for more feature extraction to complete the task that you want. And so if you're familiar with attention architectures, you know that there's another matrix, the value matrix, which I will not fo be uh, focusing on too much in this talk. I would actually just be setting it to identity and focus on what really is happening in that matrix multiplication step where you acting with the attention matrix on your input data. So, I tailored, I'm now going to move uh, to the description, to the kind of uh, story of this uh, talk 
and I tailored it to be kind of short in format, so do not really hesitate if you want to ask a question, to ask it during the talk. If you are curious about something or something is too technical, not too so clear, don't hesitate to raise your hand. So as I said, this attention matrix is kind of the central component of an attention module, and the IJ element of that matrix indicates how much the ith token should attend to the j token, how much they correlate to, how much they should pay attention to each other. For the product attention, that ij component of this matrix depends generically on four things, xi and xj, the two tokens occupying the positions you're looking in, and i and j, the two positions that you are actually looking at. So to build intuition, let's, uh, let us look at two extreme cases. If this ij element doesn't depend on i and j, but only on x i and x j, so it's only looking at the tokens, but doesn't really care how they're ordered, it's a purely semantic attention mechanism because it's essentially treating the input as a bag of words. So it's really only, um, only um, acting on the basis of the meaning of the words on the semantic content. On the other hand, if you have a IJF element which only depends on I and J, but not on the tokens sitting at those two positions. That is what has been already called uh, in the previous work by Sami Gelasti and collaborators, a purely uh, positional attention mechanism. An attention matrix that is just acting on the basis of the relative positions of the tokens, but not really taking into account the semantic content, their meaning. Of course, in most cases, you'd expect that after you train the model, the learned attention matrix will implement something in between, a bit of semantic mechanism and a bit of positional mechanism, and we like to understand just to which extent it's doing either of them and under which conditions it's learning more one or the other. This is the high-level question that we are really curious about. And so we'll try to answer or give elements of answer to that question in two ways. We'll have an empirical study on a very simple task where I'm going to show you some interesting things can happen. And then we have also a solvable model, which is more simplified, but theoretically more controlled, that you can solve exactly and extract some insight from its solution. And that will be the second part of the talk. And so regarding the experiment, what we did is to consider a very simple task, the histogram task. So in this task, you're given an input, which is just a sequence of some fixed length from some alphabet, like say A, B, C. And your task is to return a output sequence of the same length where you replace each letter by the number of time it occurs in the input. For example, A occurs twice in the input, so it's replaced by a number two in the output. B is replaced by uh, three, C is replaced by four, et cetera, et cetera. So if you train to transform a very simple architecture with just one attention layer and two dense layers, you can actually reach two different, in particular, two different regions where your gradient is zero, so they correspond to very flat regions or local minima, if you will, with high accuracy. But these two minima are characterized by very different things, algorithmic mechanism that the model has learned. So the model trained, um, a trained model behaves in qualitatively very different ways depending on which minima you actually reach. And so visualize what is happening and how they're different. Uh, so here I'm plotting the attention matrix that has been learned for one of the minimum, and I'm feeding to it three different test samples. So I'm just evaluating the attention matrix that I have learned for three different inputs. And as you can see, in the first minimum, which I will be referring to as the positional minimum, this attention matrix basically stays the same no matter which input you are feeding to it. So the ijth element of the attention matrix really doesn't depend on the input, it only depends on i and j. So this minimum corresponds to the model having learned to implement a positional mechanism, right? Because it, does, it doesn't really take into account the semantics or the particular words or sequence that you are feeding to it. If now we switch our attention to the other minimum, which I'll be calling the semantic minimum, and again plotting evaluating the attention matrix that I have learned when the model has reached that minimum in particular for three different inputs, you see that there's a high variability. The attention matrix depends more on the input. It doesn't look uh, um, similar for the three inputs, and so it has learned more of a semantic mechanism, or at least the mechanism it has learned is partially semantic. It's a 
dependent on the input that, it, that you feed to the metrics. So we have to summarize, to take the point home, is we have two different minima in the loss landscape, which correspond to the model learning two different algorithmic ways of solving the same task. One is a semantic mechanism, and the other one is correspond to more positional mechanism. Is this part kind of intuitive? Um, not intuitive, but clear for everyone? Okay. And so we wanted to understand that deeper, and we went to a solvable model, which was stripped away a lot of complexity, but this model is amenable to theoretical analysis. We can precisely characterize this model in, in a symptotic uh, limit and extract some very interesting phenomenology that is related to uh, this previous part from it. So I'll spend three technical slides presenting to you the model, so don't hesitate to interrupt me if some parts of the setting are not very clear. So the data model we'll be considering is a very simplified model for random sentences. So each input is a L times D matrix, which you can think of a sequence of L tokens, L words, that have been embedded in the dimension. So each of these tokens is assumed to be independently sampled from just some Gaussian distribution, independently from the other tokens. So the words are independent from each other, and they're not statistically correlated. So of course, you can complexify that sentence model, but this one yields really interesting phenomenology already. Yes? Ex uh, ex to be embedded in the same, same, same space, yes. And so the tokens do not statistically interact, they're not statistically correlated, but the task that you will want to complete will involve some interaction between the tokens, as we will see. So we'll be considering a supervised machine learning task where your goal is to learn, it, train a neural network to approximate or to learn some target function. Or another way to say it is that you have a target function generated your, generating your labels. And the target function that we'll be interested in has this um, rather convoluted form that I will walk you through and kind of decompose the bits in it for you. So it's essentially just a, combi a linear combination of two terms, weighted by omega and one minus omega for some omega between zero and one. So if you look at the first term here in green, it's a dot product tension um, matrix, softmax of quadratic form, of the input x parameterized by some vector w star, which are the weights of the teacher, if you will. So what's really important beyond this mathematical form is that if you look at the ij element of that green L times L matrix, you can convince yourself that it's only depending on xi and xj, but not on i and j. So basically, it's a purely semantic attention matrix. On the other hand, the other term in this linear combination, A, is just a fixed L times L matrix. It doesn't depend on the input, so if you look at the IJ element for that red A matrix, it will only depend on I and J, but not on the input. So in other words, this red bit is a purely positional attention matrix. Is that sort of, clear? Yeah. okay. And so, depending on which omega you have, you have a weighted linear combination of a purely semantic part and a purely um, positional part. So you have like a varying semantic or positional content in your target function. And so depending on how, which one is dominant, the neural network that you want to train will have to learn to implement either a more semantic mechanism or a more positional mechanism in order to satisfyingly learn and approximate the target function. And so we have a data model, we have a target function, and we just assume that we have a train set with n samples, which have been independently sampled from the data distribution, and the corresponding labels, which are just the target function evaluated at that particular sample. It's deterministic, yeah. So in practice, it will be, yeah. So it, we just took one particular case in the plus that I'm going to show you. And so they uh, will be uh, interested in what is being learned by a single attention layer. So we're stripping all the complexity of the language model, we're just really focusing on this one attention layer. And so the architecture I'm considering is of dot product attention form, so it's again a softmax of a uh, quadratic form of the input parameterized by some vector 
W. And uh, here in orange, I think. And they, um, importantly, the data has been shifted by a fixed matrix P, which is L times D, and correspond to positional encodings. So in the following, to be kind of, uh, to have more definiteness, I will be taking length two sequences, and then this positional encodings I will just take to be one vector mu, stacked horizon vertically with minus mu. And so we can try to fit the target function using that attention layer just by minimizing an empirical risk, which is the sum of the training sample, the quadratic cost function, plus some L2 regularization term. And we'll be analyzing that learning problem in the asymptotic limit where the number of samples n in your train set on the dimension d of your embedding jointly tend to infinity while staying comparably large, by which I mean the ratio n divided by d stays of order one. And I'm also, taking, I'm also taking the other dimensions of the problem, so the length of the sequence and the norm of the positional encodings to stay finite, stay of order one. I just want to mention uh, this other work that actually has been performed by um, Indian collaborators, uh, which I think um, Federica actually presented in the previous edition of European High Dimension, which also consists in a sharp, tight, asymptotic analysis of an attention model, which is rather different. We're looking at supervised setting, we're looking at some mask language modeling training procedure. But they're looking at infinite length sentence and finite uh, dimension, we are looking at the complementary asymptotic, uh, asymptotic um, limit, so it's a complementary asymptotic exploration to their paper. So just a recap, we have a data model, uncorrelated tokens, each token is a Gaussian. We're trying to fit a target function with varying semantic versus positional content, and we're trying to learn that using an attention layer, minimizing some quadratic risk, and we're interested in what's the generalization error at the end of the day. Is the setup clear? Yes. I'm only learning W. Yeah. So, so the A is parameterizing the target function, so it's not trained. It's, like it's a parameter of the model, of the data distribution, if you will. And no, we're not, we're only training W, and we're fixing the position encoding, so the MB practice, you will train the embedding and the positional encodings as well. We're not doing that. We're only just really training the, um, the weights. And so I would just take the opportunity to, to make the connection to maybe more realistic attention layer architectures. We're familiar with them. So what we simplified in our model is that we considered low rank um, weight and key matrices. And we also tied them to be the same vector W. And as I said before, we also fixed the value matrix to be identity because we're really interested in this intention matrix part. And we want to study that in isolation. Is that good for everyone? So that's the setup of our solvable model. And now we want to, um, <clears throat> we, we can actually characterize the learning asymptotically tightly. So using the replica method from statistical physics, we assume also replica symmetry, which we check afterwards just by looking at the agreement with numerical experiments. We can reach a tight formula for the training loss and the test error achieved by that model. And I shrunk, purposefully shrank the um, expressions because the mathematical form of them are not really, really important. What I really want to, to, to kind of emphasize is that this formula uh, in terms of the small set of summary statistics, low dimensional summary statistics here um, colored. And that these low dimensional summary statistics are themselves characterized as the solution of a set of equations, which are again shrunk, uh, which are sometimes referred to under the umbrella of replica equations. So taking a step back, what we did is to describe a non-convex, non-linear, um, learning problem in high dimension in terms of a small set of scalar of low dimensional summary statistics. And so we can just analyze this system of equation, extract the behavior of the summary statistics, and that will tell us something about what's happening in the learning problem. So the rest of the talk, I will walk you through the insights that you can gather from this analysis. And notably, we'll focus on two of the summary statistics, 
The first one, M, is the alignment between the train weights, W, and the positional encodings, mu. So a high alignment means that your model is essentially, has essentially learned to leverage the positional encodings to express some fixed positional information and therefore is implementing a partially positional mechanism. The other summary statistic I want to focus on is theta, which is the, basically the overlap or the alignment between the train weights W hat and the target weights W star. So if you have a high alignment, it means that the network has identified that there was some semantic content in the target, has identified the weight vector W star that is parameterizing that semantic content, and is able to implement a semantic mechanism to approximate that part of the target. So what we find is that in particular in this non-convex lot landscape, there exists two minima. In the first minimum, there is a finite alignment with the positional encodings, but zero alignment with the target weight. So this corresponds to a minimum where the model has, been, uh, has learned to implement a partly positional mechanism. And another minimum, which is characterized this time by zero, encoding, zero overlap with the positional encodings and finite overlap with the target weights which this time correspond to the model having learned another algorithmic mechanism, the semantic mechanism, uh, that it can implement to satisfying the approximate teacher. So again, we find this a behavior where we have two distinct minimum in the loss landscape corresponding to two different algorithmic solutions, as it were, to complete a given task, and that can be learned by the same model. So which one is lower in training loss? Well, it actually depends on the number of training samples in your train set. So when you have a small amount of training samples, the positional minimum is lower in training loss. And beyond a certain critical value alpha c in number of training samples or in sample complexity, the semantic minimum is actually global. And this sample complexity alpha c where the two minimums switch place correspond to what we call in statistical physics a first order phase transition. And so this is a phase diagram, just another way to visualize what I just told you. So I'm plotting the sample complexity on the x axis. On the y axis, I have this parameter omega, remember, which controls how much positional semantic content was in my teacher, my target. And so the color map corresponds to numerical experiments where I try to measure the different difference in training laws between the positional minimum and the semantic. Bluish means that the positional minimum is lower in, in, in training loss, and uh, pinkish means that the semantic minimum is actually lower in training loss. Dashed green correspond to this theoretical prediction that I um, just told you about, about this critical sample complexity where the two minimum switch place. And you see that it agrees uh, well with the uh, numerical experiment. And so, just maybe a technical um, parenthesis just to be completely clear. So the color map corresponds to numerical experiment. And so to measure the training loss of the positional semantic minimum, we actually, have, we actually have to initialize GD in two different ways. Either we initialize it at the positional encodings or we initialize it at the teacher weight. So our goal is more to conduct a landscape analysis more than a study of the dynamics, and that's why we allow ourselves to do this kind of things, but we are not providing a description of what happens if you run, for example, Adam or GD from a random initialization. And in fact, the uh, initializing at the teacher weight, of course, is an informed initialization, which you would not be able to do in practice. End of the parenthesis. And so another bit of intuition that I want to give you in this before moving from that slide is that um, you may notice that the critical sample complexity alpha c, which is given again by this dashed green line, is an increasing function of omega, which is again intuitive because large omega means less semantic content in your target and therefore the model needs more data to actually identify the semantic content and learn the relevant parameter and learn the semantic mechanism to, to learn it. Yes. It 
depends on your A matrix. So if you, the purely semantic one or the purely? The A matrix, it depends on your A matrix. If it's part of the set of matrices that can be expressed yeah. by your function. But it's a very uh, good point, <laughs> a good transition to my next slide. So as I told you, with a lot of data, the model is able to learn another mechanism, like the semantic mechanism. And you may wonder, is it really, does, is it really essential to the model performing well? Can it actually perform very well with just learning the positional mechanism that it learns with very few data? And to have insight about that question, we're comparing this dot product attention model, which I remind here in green, to another simple model, a baseline, which is just a linear model where you train a matrix B, L times L matrix B using, a, again, a quadratic loss function on your train set. And so when you, uh, this model is purely positioned, because at the end of the day, what you get is just some L times L matrix B at acting on your input. And if you look at the IJF element of that B matrix, it's not parameterized in a way that it can depend on the input. So it will only depend on I and J. So the model that you learn at the end is purely positional. So again, you can reach a tight asymptotic characterization of what that simple baseline model is learning. And what we find is that for a small number of samples, this model is performing better uh, than the dot product attention model. Of course, depends on the regularization and the details of, the, of your setting. But above a certain number of training samples, alpha L, the dot product attention is performing better in the sense that it's reaching a lower test error. And what's very uh, um, interesting is that this uh, alpha L uh, sample complexity where this happens, where the dot product attention manages to outperform this very simple, purely positional model, happens after this phase transition at alpha C where it's actually managing to run the semantic mechanism. So it's very, very tempting to, on a very high level, intu uh, have the intuition that the dot product attention needs to learn this qualitatively different algorithmic uh, mechanism, the semantic mechanism, in order to be more performant than a model that is constrained to be just purely positional. So uh, just summarizing in a few slides with another plot, for the story of this, uh, this whole um, analysis. So I'm plotting here the number of training samples on the x-axis, the sample complexity versus, again, the um, semantic uh, content and the target function. Uh, the color map corresponds to numerical experiments probing the difference in generalization error between the purely positional model and the dot product model. And the dashed lines correspond to well, theoretical predictions for when this crossover where the dot product attention manages to perform better happens. And so, as I promised a summary slide, which corresponds to just a slice of this phase diagram. So I'm again plotting the sample complexity on the x-axis and the test error achieved by the dot product attention on the y-axis. Those correspond to numerical experiments, solid lines to theoretical predictions. And so what happens at low sample complexity, just to summarize, that the dot product attention learns to approximate the target function using a positional mechanism and is performing worse than the purely positional baseline model, this very simple linear model, remember, which is here represented in uh, orange. But beyond a certain number of training samples, the first order phase transition happens, and the uh, dot product attention learns a qualitatively new mechanism, the semantic mechanism, which leverages to approximate better target function, to complete the task better. And this is, um, signaled by a sharp drop in the generalization error. And for enough data, it's further managing to beat this purely positional baseline, again, given in orange. And so uh, just a few uh, takeaway messages. We have a solvable model where we have this uh, phenomenon that we have two distinct minimum in the loss landscape corresponding to the model learning two different algorithmic mechanism to complete given task, we saw that the simple model learns one or the other in succession, depending on the number of training samples that it has access to. 
And uh, just to reiterate some future steps, of course, is to look at more intricate, more complex models, but also at the dynamics of the learning, because that was the difference, uh, in difference to the previous talks, a static analysis where really just focused on the properties of minima and the loss landscape. Uh, thank you for your attention. All right, we have some time for questions. David? Thanks, this is super cool. Um, so I was wondering, uh, you, when you have those mean field equations, presumably you have to solve them numerically. When you solve them, do you always find one of these two kinds of solutions, the positional or the semantic one, or do you get other stuff sometimes? That's a very good question. So we find in particular <laughs> those two, but we did not do an exhaustive search for all the solutions of this mean field equation. So there could be more uh, solutions to this, but we did not do an exhaustive landscape analysis. So in particular, we found those two correspond to two different qualitative uh, mechanisms. We focus on analyzing, characterizing those two, but there could be other and other interesting ones. Do you know if there is any um, phase transition? If you let it run over a large number of epochs or like trainings, and um, is there a transition from one to the other mode or phase? So you mean as a function of training time during training? Yeah, like um, for the few first few samples or for the four first few epochs, it's in the in the maybe positional, mm -hmm. and then if you go on, it switches into the different phase. And yes, so no, we didn't observe that. So in the experiments that we run, at least we always saw it converging to one minimum or the other, or going somewhere else and staying there, and not like switching between going from one minimum to the other. But it might be interesting in another empirical paper by Angelina Chen and some collaborators from NYU, which is um, purely empirical. They do experiments with BERT, and they see, again, what they call phase transitions. That means sharp qualitative changes during training time. But we did not observe that in, our, in this implement setting. And also for, um, I mean, you looked at a minimal model, right? <laughs> like uh, yes. if you have a more complicated, um, a more complex lost landscape. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know. I uh, didn't. Okay, okay. Yes. So the point of considering a minimum model was to have something that we could analyze. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, the complex model, lots of lots remains to be done. So very and, exciting stuff. And one last small question: um, Did you somehow control the noisiness, or? No, we didn't. So okay. the target function is always non-stochastic. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, so I guess from a practical perspective, um, I don't know, maybe it's kind of more natural to think like the optimal attention matrix depends both on the position and the semantic. So like, do you have any thoughts on that? Sorry, or can you come again? Sorry. Uh, I'm just saying, like, from a practical perspective, mm -hmm. maybe it's more natural to think the optimal attention matrix depends both on the position and the semantics. Yes, yes. But you're saying, like, um, it can just be one of the two. So I'm wondering, oh, do you have no. any thought on so, that? Yeah. So you're referring to the, tar the choice of target function. Yeah. So, it, so we chose it to be a combination, in a combination of two terms, just for simplicity. But you could also consider uh, attention matrices that mix position and semantics in a more uh, intricate way. For example, having some feature position encoding, so having it of the same form of the student but with another set of position encodings. Mm -hmm. That matrix will have an IJF element which depends uh, non-linearly on the um, position and the tokens, and it could also actually analyze that. But here, yeah, the point of the target function was to model the fact that we need to have the two, um, the two ingredients in the recipe, but we could have done another parameterization. That was just for Thank one you. of the possible things that you could uh, consider. Thank you. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, sorry, I have another experimental question. So the initial experiment, the motivating where you see mm -hmm. the two minima, 
Uh, first of all, I wanted to ask if you're using Gaussian data or some embedded data or if you're using actually embedded text. And so, yeah, more details about the architecture in general. Yeah, so, sure. So in that uh, setting, actually, we're doing, it's more realistic than what I present in the solvable model in the sense that we're training the embeddings and we're also training um, positional encoding. So both of those things are trained. Okay, so you start from, uh, you know, start fixed from tokens like A, B, B, C, and then you train the embeddings and everything is trained. Everything is trained, yeah. So okay. the embeddings is trained, the positional encoding is trained. Which is the embedding dimension? Um, I will come back to Doesn't matter. Like, to, to and, okay, one last question. Yes. Sorry, one last question. This is uh, if you also see here uh, more likely convergence towards the semantic minima if you increase the number of training samples. No, we did not observe that in this, in this setting. So actually, also in this setting, we have to train in very particular ways by tr freezing some weights during training to reach this two minimum. So mm -hmm. the point here was that we can this minimum exist and have different qualities, but we again didn't explore sure. where it goes from random initialization if you don't constrain it. So it's a very, very, I think, a nice path for our future exploration. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll also ask one. Um, did you also, can you also get an AMP-like algorithm that gets to the fixed points of a replica? Yes. Yes, it's actually, I didn't present to okay. it, but it's, it's, um, there's an AMP associated that you can write down. And does it look anything like GD? So can you make a connection between that yes. and something less cumbersome? So again, I put that into okay. balance. Basically, what you can show is that uh, the stable fixed point of that mean field, uh, system of mean field equations correspond uh -huh. to, um, to, um, yes. to fixed points uh -huh. of this generalized approximate message passing algorithm. And this fixed point of this algorithm correspond to fixed point of gradient descent. Oh, I see. Okay. So uh, this is why the um, properties of the minima or the critical points of the Lantz landscape are contained or hidden in these equations because there's, there's this correspondence via ex exactly AMP okay. algorithms. Thanks. So, yeah. And that looks like a nice way to conclude this part. Thank Thanks a lot, Hugo. <laughs>